Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for the Sunday morning service of Tusculum Hills Baptist Church, a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word from Pastor Paul Gunn. Today I'll be preaching from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25 for the reading this morning. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. The Bible says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is, His body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. A little review of Hebrews here. We don't really know the author. We believe that the intended audience was Jews. They were Jews and they were Jews who were probably considering uh, leaving the faith or they were Jews who needed encouragement. And the the, the other thing that we know about Hebrews in this uh, short review is that Hebrews points out the foreshadowing of the Old Covenant for the New Covenant. The foreshadowing that the, the temple was just a foreshadow of things to come. The, the sacrifices of the animals in the Old Testament was a foreshadowing of things to come and about how all those things were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And Hebrews points out what is not so obvious to most people. Hebrews puts together all those clues in the Old Testament and solves the mystery once for all. So the, the title of my message today is Confidence Because of Christ. And my first point is this. I'm confident in the work of Christ long ago. I'm confident in, in that. In the Old Testament, not one single person would have dared enter the Holy of Holies in the temple except for the priest in the tabernacle, in the tent, in the wilderness. And he did that only once per year. And between the place where the people could enter and where the, the priest went once per year was this thick veil. It was a big curtain. It was a wall. Three to four inches thick. Some people uh, think maybe even thicker. Now go back to verse 19 and look at this while I explain. The Old Testament did not, the Old Testament people did not have the confidence to enter the most holy place. But today, New Testament believers do have confidence to enter the most holy place before the throne of God because of Jesus Christ. Old Testament Believers were separated by that thick veil or curtain, but for us today, Jesus is the veil. Matthew chapter 27 verse 51 and Mark chapter, 1 verse, uh, Mark chapter 15 verse 38 tells us that at Jesus' crucifixion, that veil was torn from the top to the bottom. It was something that no human could do. God tore that veil. It could not be done with these human hands. And so, therefore, Jesus becomes the veil for us. Jesus is who we pass through to get to the throne of God. Now go back to verses 20 and verses 21 and look at them while, while I explain. In the Old Testament, 
Only that one priest passed through the veil into the presence of God, but today all believers, not just one priest, but all believers can pass through Jesus to get into the presence of God. He is our high priest, and we have access to Him at any time. If people could have heard this message before the time of Christ, they would have never believed it to be so, or that it would come to pass someday. Jesus is not merely a man, but He's the God-man. He's not like one of the earth, earthly priests who could perform only one function at a time. Jesus is the King of kings. And He is also, listen to me here, He is the King of multitasking because we can all go to Him simultaneously. And the Bible tells us that He is interceding for us right now at the right hand of the throne of the Father, praying for us all simultaneously. We do not have to stand in line. We don't have to take a number. We do not have to beg Him. We do not have to enchant Him like some type of idol or some type of charm. All we do is go to Jesus and we pray and He hears our prayers. The Bible says right here that we are to approach Him with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that He is our Savior. Not the half assurance, but the full assurance. Look in verse 22. Do you see where it says, having our hearts sprinkled? What does this mean? The Old Testament priest took blood and, and sprinkled it on the mercy seat of, of the Ark of the Covenant there as an atonement for people's sins. And today, each one of us has been sprinkled by the blood of Jesus, which forgives all sins. What a glorious truth this is. Next, I have confidence that the work of Christ is relevant for today. I have confidence that the work of the work of Christ from long ago, I have confidence that the work of Christ is relevant for today. The writer of Hebrews did this comparison contrast here to remind the Jewish reader how different life is with Christ. Now Hebrews may be a bit harder for us to understand than other scriptures. Uh, someone this week told me they have never heard some of the sermons that I've been preaching, although this one man told me he's been in church all of his life. Hebrews is a bit harder for us to understand than some of the other scriptures because it was written for people that think a little differently than we do. Romans is much easier for us to understand because most of us as Americans tend to think more in line with the way that Romans is written. But the truth of Hebrews is profound if we dig a little deeper and we see what is the meaning behind this. And this comparison contrast was, was here to remind the reader how different life is with Christ. The new way with Christ was so much better than the old way, why would anyone ever want to go back? Occasionally I will hear someone talk about Cars, the old family car from long ago, and if inevitably someone will say they don't make them what? Like they used to. And you know it's probably a good thing really. Uh, many motors had to be rebuilt around 50 or 60,000 miles. Uh, no seat belts. Uh, no airbags. Uh, cars rusted sooner than cars rust today. And really, really very few of yesteryear's cars are daily drivers. There is a guy over in the Mount Juliet area that drives an Edsel all over the place. Other than that, most people are driving rather modern cars. Uh, I have a son that gets excited about old technology. He'll run across something at the Nashville flea market or at some junk store somewhere, and to him it's like he has discovered something new, some type of new invention. So he has introduced me to Polaroid cameras. <laughs> he has introduced me to little 45 records. He has introduced me to cassette players and all these things. And he plays with these for a little while, then he loses interest, 
and he goes back to the new technology. So I'm, I'm putting all that into a box, and someday when he has his own place, I'm going to give him a Christmas gift all wrapped up, and it's going to be his collection of old technology. But you know, OT, old technology, kind of reminds me of o, another OT, the Old Testament. The Old Testament is God's Word. It is the foundation on which the New Testament was built. But in the way that old technology is put away for the new, the Old Testament is not put away, but it, fulfilled, it is fulfilled in the New Testament. You know, occasionally there is some type of uh, new technology that doesn't really fare too well, and it goes away. And we have some people here that I know will remember what I'm about to tell you. When I was about six or seven years old, I remember a TV commercial that came on all the time. Every other TV commercial. This kitchen gadget would fix all the problems of the modern housewife. If you would just buy this one kitchen gadget with all these attachments, all the problems of the modern kitchen would be solved. And my mother said something to my dad about it until finally he broke down and ordered a Vegematic. <laughs> I was about uh, six or seven years old when that Vegematic came in the mail. And my dad happened to be home from work that day and he and my mom opened up that Vegematic. It was like looking at a newborn child. <laughs> my mom was excited. My dad was so excited that he'd gotten a gadget for my mom that didn't cost a lot. And so he decided that he was going to try it out. And he put a tomato on top of that Vegematic. And he pressed down on the lid. How many of you did that? He pressed down on the lid of that and chunks of tomato and tomato juice splattered all over the kitchen. <laughs> and that was the first and the last time the Vegematic was used. <laughs> now you can find Vegematics cheap and they're usually the subject of uh, gag gifts at Christmas parties, but sometimes new technology doesn't fare too well and it goes away. Why? Because it was just an idea that wasn't needed. Or it was an idea that needed to be refined a little more before it went to market. But listen to this. I want you to hear this. The writer of Hebrews gave people the advantages of the new way in Christ, begging the question as to why anyone would want to return to the old obsolete way of worshiping Him. And the great truth about God's new way through Jesus is that there was nothing about it that needed to be improved. There was nothing about it that needed to be refined. There was no waste with the new covenant. There was nothing about the saving work of Jesus Christ that would ever become obsolete. And the new believer today that comes to faith in Christ has that fresh sense of renewal in the same way that someone 2,000 years ago had when they came to faith in Christ. You see, repentance never becomes old. Repentance never becomes outdated. Forgiveness of Jesus Christ never becomes old, never becomes outdated. It never becomes obsolete. It will always be current. So the question is, why were there some people that were considering going back to the old way of worshiping God? Probably because they had only done it one way for so long and change was difficult. Now, my next point is this. I have confidence that the work of Christ will be relevant for tomorrow. I'm confident in the work of Christ of yesteryear, of today, and for tomorrow. A hundred years ago, people went to church with no electricity. There may have been a few churches that had electricity uh, exactly a hundred years ago. Not many. Not many in this area, probably. There were a few cars, but most people arrived on horses and buggies. The clothes looked completely different. Today we all arrived in nice modern cars. 
we came to a nice modern building. But think about this, even a thousand years ago, the world looked vastly different than it did just a hundred years ago. But yesterday's message about Christ and today's message about Christ is still the same. And tomorrow's message about Christ is still the same. Listen to me. No matter what the future holds, this message will still be the same. If the Lord should tarry another hundred years and if man can go back and forth to the moon and back and forth to Mars and if man can can through the grace of God come up with a cure for cancer and other diseases and if they're eradicated from the earth and if, if the lifestyle of people a hundred years from now is completely different than that of today, guess what? The message of Christ will still be exactly the same. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. You have the same truth of Christ as the writer of Hebrews with not one single update. And since this message never changes, since it never needs any updates, then it's important for us to know it. It's important for us to live it. It's important for us to learn more about it so that we can live it out more. Verse 23 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. We could easily say it this way. Let us hold unswervingly because Jesus is unswerving. A promise is an indicator of something to come, isn't it? If you promise to do something, it means that you fully intend on doing it. God keeps His promises. Sometimes man may break his promises, but God will not break His promises. So what are we to do today? We are to hold on to the promise. We are not to shrink back, as the verse says later on in the chapter. The promise is that someday Jesus will return, not as a sacrifice for sin, but as a triumphant Savior to take His people home. And the Scripture says, gather more and encourage each other more as that day approaches. We hold on to this promise, even if we don't see it in our lifetime. I recently read a Facebook post where a woman claimed to be an atheist and she rambled on about a few things and I thought, what a boring life. You know, just what a boring life. For what, what purpose is she living? See, she's, she's only living for hope for today. Basically making a living, buying a few things and building some type of earthly security. She says that she believes all we are is matter and energy. And again, what a boring life. You know, now, I don't in any way right here intend to sound arrogant or condescending toward this woman because I believe that she's on a search. But if what she says is true, then that means my entire life and my vocation has been nothing but a sham. It means the consoling that I've given to people at funerals is nothing more than false hope. It means the baptisms that I've done are nothing more than some type of aquatic exercise. It means the prayers that I've prayed have done nothing more than, 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 than provide some type, of, some type of exercise for internal meditation. You know, I'd much have a life with deeper meaning that offers hope for a better tomorrow because of the resurrected Lord. And if you really believe that, that, that there is this hope, we must join together unswervingly, hanging on to this hope that we profess. And this week, we're going to have little boys and girls coming into this building that know absolutely nothing about this hope that is in Christ. And they are going to hear it for the first time in this building. This message from the book of Hebrews has stimulated uh, quite a few conversations and some emails. And I, I really love these conversations because some of these truths are rather abstract and they require us to think. 
And these truths require us to stretch our faith because we learn that the work of Christ is much bigger than we originally thought. And when our minds are expanded just a little more to understand just a little more about this work of Christ, then we learn that it's even bigger than we thought. And as we grow older, and as we reach our twilight years, we realize that this work of Christ is still what? Even bigger. And then when we take that last breath and our heart beats its last beat and our mind thinks its last earthly thought and this soul leaves this body and goes into heaven, guess what? We learn that the work of Christ is even bigger than we thought. Some of you are outgrowing your childish ideas of Jesus as merely this little poor baby in a manger and you're realizing the shocking truth that this majestic Savior of the universe owes us absolutely nothing yet He cares for each and every one of us individually. If you put your hope into yourself, you'll disappoint yourself and someday you'll awake to the fact that you can no longer do anything for yourself. Uh, I've had a little bit of experience uh, with hospice patients at one of the hospice residences here in Nashville. And one of the things that I've learned is that the dying process is a process of letting go. You know, if you put your hope into people, they will let you down. How many of you, don't raise your hand, but how many of you have been let down by at least one person? How many of you have been let down by more than one person? Probably everybody in here. But if your hope is in Christ, you are secure. How many of you can say, you can raise your hand on this if you want to, how many of you can say that you have been let down by Jesus? Anybody? Okay, it looks like it's unanimous. The motion fails. <laughs> Nobody has been let down by Jesus. Is there anyone here who would say today you wish you had never gone down this road of being a Christian? Anybody? I don't see any takers. And I am confident of this work of Christ that began so long ago. He, com he completed this with His work and He left nothing undone. I'm confident that the work of Christ is relevant for today. It needs no updates. I'm confident that the work of Christ will be relevant for tomorrow. People in the future will come to Christ through repentance and faith the same way that we do today. This is the hope that we have in Christ as explained to us here in Hebrews chapter 10. Let's bow our heads for prayer. We'll go to our invitation time. This is our time when we invite you to come to faith in Christ. Maybe you've heard this message today about hope in Christ and you, you're thinking inside, I need that hope and I don't have that hope. Maybe you've heard it before. Maybe this is the first time you've heard about that hope in Christ. Today is the day that you can claim that hope. Today you can ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin. You can ask Him to cleanse you. You can ask Him to become your Savior in a spirit of faith and repentance, and He will do it. Heavenly Father, we come to You during our invitation time. We thank You for this time that we can commit to follow Christ. And for those of us here today who are believers, this is a time when we can recommit to follow You. I pray for the person that's here today who's never received Jesus as Lord and Savior, that today may be the day that they would do that. Bring conviction on us at this time. Help us to really know and really understand and believe that Jesus is our only hope, and that all other hopes are faulty. During this time, Lord, we pray that your will would be done in the lives of our people. In Christ's name, amen. During this invitation time, we'll open it to those who need to be saved today, as well as someone else who may need prayer or any other decision that needs to be made. Let's stand together and Terry will lead us.
Oh. 